Flashlights are incredibly useful tools, but they can also be fun. Occasionally, a flashlight is made which goes all out and caters directly to hobbyists, and the result is pretty amazing. This is what happens when that concept is taken to its logical extreme. A light so sophisticated it can be confusing, so powerful it becomes dangerous, and so fun it has to be owned. The D4V2 is a small yet powerful light which is built by Hank Wong and utilizes the Andrel firmware created by Toykeeper. These are highly customizable lights packed with many enthusiast-oriented features, yet despite their high quality, are pretty affordable. The hot rod design philosophy makes for an extremely powerful flashlight, so much so that it is actually somewhat dangerous. This is a special light that deserves a special review, so this video is going to be very detailed and long. But because so much customization is available, I will just cover the standard options. The D4V2 is super compact, being only 9.5cm long and 2.8cm wide at the head, making it the smallest 18650 light I've yet owned. The aluminum version weighs in at 75 grams without a battery, while the titanium version is substantially heavier. Though available in various materials, the design is the same across all versions. This is an exceptionally well-built light, with great machining and a refined design. Both the head and tail possess high-end beryllium copper gold-plated springs. The quality springs ensure great connection and low resistance, which is important in a light drawing this much current. The springs are very firm, and because the light is so compact with such a tight fit, only unprotected flat top cells can be used. The battery tube is thick and anodized on the interior, and is very snug with no rattle. The threads on the head and tail are thick and square cut, and are anodized with an application of lubricant and have a nitrile o-ring seal. The threads are machined very precisely and are super smooth and tight, making the tail cap extremely satisfying to thread on and off the body. However, the titanium version is much less pleasant, as the threads are very gritty and rough. Aside from the heavy grit in the threads, the tie light is just as precisely machined as the aluminum version. There are PCBs in both the head and tail of the light. This means that physical lockout of the tail cap is possible on the non-anodized materials, such as this titanium model. The PCB in the head has flashing pins for updating the firmware of the light, and the color of the board reflects the driver used. The body of the light has some of the cleanest, nicest knurling I've ever seen, and feels fantastic to hold. The aluminum version is especially smooth and pleasant in the hand, and I just love the thick, even anodizing with its matte finish. The titanium version has an interesting feel, being grippy but not sharp or aggressive, which I can't quite describe. It's almost like the light is sticky in the hand. The body has just a bare metal finish with visible machining lines, which is very attractive in my opinion. I have seen sandblasted versions of this light floating around on the internet, which look cool, but I prefer this shiny machined finish. The pill of the light features several shallow heatsink grooves and a prominent raised section with a very clicky, satisfying e-switch, which includes four extra LEDs on the fancier models. Surrounding this switch is a retaining ring, available either as a version sitting flush with the pill or which is prominently raised. This is the version I have on both of my lights to prevent accidental activation. Above the pill sits a thick bezel made in the same material as the rest of the body, while an extra stainless steel bezel can be purchased for the aluminum model. This extra bezel may add some durability, but mostly just looks nice. Below the bezel sits a quality piece of mineral crystal glass with excellent anti-reflective coating, which protects a polycarbonate Carclo Quad TIR optic. This optic is available in either the clear 10622 model, which comes standard, or the frosted 10623 that provides a floodier beam. The optic fits rather snugly into the head and is secured with thermal compound on the mounting posts. The D4V2 has a dual PCB setup with eight RGB auxiliary LEDs soldered to the upper board, which has four cutouts for the main emitters mounted on the solid copper MC PCB below. The standard D4V2 is available for purchase in anodized aluminum with several different color options and a fancier version with a backlit side switch can be purchased in plain and anodized titanium or in solid copper or brass. Unlike the other materials available, titanium is a poor conductor of heat, and as such there is no version available with a solid titanium pill. Of course, these are just the standard options. If you email Hank, you can order these lights with just about any combination of materials you desire, and you can order an aluminum light with a backlit switch. Overall, the build of this light is fantastic for the price, with a refined, premium feel that defies its price tag. However, the D4V2 is not especially durable, with an IP67 waterproof rating and no stated impact resistance, though MSR lights are known to be kind of delicate. 
I have dropped mine a few times, and it's been okay, but this is not exactly a light for surviving the end of days. Oh, and I should mention you can get the light with a strong magnet in the tail cap, which works well even in the heavier models. You can also get a tail cap with or without a lanyard hole, you can add a stainless steel pocket clip, you can buy an 18350 battery tube, and you can separately purchase every component that makes up this light, so it's great for tinkering with and modding. There are just so many possibilities, but more importantly, every light that Hank produces is built extremely well and is always of high quality. The D4 V2 comes equipped with a fantastic Andural interface. This is a complex and sophisticated firmware that was designed by an enthusiast for enthusiasts, and as such is a perfect fit for this light. It is well loved by the community, but is also considered to be entirely too much for beginners. In fact, this UI is so feature rich that I'm going to dedicate a whole separate video to it, and we'll just cover the highlights here. The interface is operated entirely through a single button, and the basic functions are actually rather simple and should be easy enough to understand. A single press of the button from off will turn the light on, and clicking again will turn it back off. Pressing and holding while on will ramp up through the brightness, and a quick tap and hold will ramp down. Pressing and holding from off will activate the minimum ramp level, or a double tap from off will activate the ramp ceiling. While on, a double tap will activate turbo. Three clicks while on will switch between smooth ramping or stepped output, and both have independently configurable ramp minimums and maximums, with 150 brightness levels available, while turbo will always produce the highest output possible. The number of discrete levels in stepped mode can also be set as desired, anywhere from 2 to 150 different levels. Four presses from off will activate lockout mode, which prevents any high outputs from being used. It allows for the momentary use of both stored minimum ramp levels by pressing and holding from memory 1 or a quick press and hold from memory 2. Lockout also has independent auxiliary LED settings for quick visual identification. This mode is pretty ingenious, as it allows for safely carrying the light while still providing those low output levels. Because it uses the user-defined ramp minimums, you can still set these as high as you want for access and lockout. Another safety feature that I really like is Muggle Mode, which is activated by six quick presses. This mode will limit the output to only 300 lumens or so, which makes the light much safer for kids and the uninitiated to use. I think this feature is awesome. Considering how bright and powerful the light is, Muggle Mode is a great feature that allows others to handle it without any issues. This setting will be remembered even if the battery is removed or the connection otherwise cut, to ensure safety. There are many more modes and features built into this firmware, and there is huge customization potential. The light has a built-in temperature sensor and intelligent temperature control, but the maximum target temperature can be adjusted by the user to allow for more runtime on turbo. There are several strobe and blinking modes with adjustable rates and output, and there is a sunset mode which will gradually decrease output in accordance with the configurable timer. There is also a mode which flickers like a candle and can be set to shut off with the timer. One of my favorite features is manual mode memory. By default, the light will remember the last used mode, but if you pick an output you like and then press the button five times, that level will be locked in memory and will always default on from off. My titanium light is set to stepped mode with five modes and is set to always turn on into low, as is my aluminum light, which is left on to ramping operation. Both of mine are set to a minimum of two on memory one and three on memory two, and a maximum of 129 on high. There's so much to this interface I won't cover it all in this video, which is already going to be super long, so I'll leave it here. There's tons of features and tons of customization, and it's all great fun. It can even be useful, which is a nice bonus. Seriously though, more than just a gimmick, I think this is a very functional UI. Being able to customize the interface to your own usage is fantastic, and Andural is far easier to understand and operate than some people claim it is. It may seem daunting at first, but can be easily learned and memorized in just a few minutes and there are some useful diagrams online that can help with this. However, I certainly understand the hesitation some people have with this interface, and agree that it's really aimed at enthusiasts, and is probably just too needlessly complicated for most people. If you just want light, you don't need Andural. But if you want light your way, Andural is perfect. If that still isn't enough for you, and you are feeling absolutely insane, then the D4 V2 is equipped with four pins on its PCB that will allow you to flash custom firmware onto the controller. This is intended for UI updates, but if you desire, then you can flash a different firmware, or even a modified version of Andural, since all the code is open source. After all, why not? Unfortunately, there are a couple minor issues here. I did notice a couple bugs in my lights, which in theory could be rectified with the firmware update, but I did not purchase the flashing kit. 
My titanium light is running newer firmware, and the battery voltage indicator is more detailed, while the rainbow flashing lights are much quicker. However, there's also an annoying bug wherein the party strobe mode just doesn't work. I don't use this mode anyway, but it can be frustrating when issues like these crop up. To help with this, Andril does allow for checking the firmware and has a factory reset option built in. These are both quite useful features. However, this can be made slightly more confusing when one considers that the different drivers actually are loaded with slightly different versions of Andril. There is a low voltage cutoff built in here, which is necessary as only unprotected cells are usable. When approaching 2.8 volts, the light will step down rather dramatically and then shut off once it hits a low enough voltage. If you aren't paying attention to your charge level, this can come rather abruptly. Finally, one minor note on the level ramping. The build of Andril used in the light depends on the driver setup, and if you are using the FET plus one driver, the light will blink during the ramp to indicate that it has switched from regulated to unregulated outputs, which roughly corresponds to the visual center of the ramp. The linear driver versions are fully regulated and lack this intermediate blink. The blink is rather useful as it allows for easy setting of the medium mode. But wait, there's more. All of this talk about the UI and I haven't even addressed the best part yet, the auxiliary LEDs. The D4V2 is equipped with eight secondary RGB LEDs sitting beside the main emitters under the optic and is available with four more LEDs under the side switch. The switch emitters are only available in single color options, which are selected while ordering the light, and they more or less operate in tandem with the front auxiliaries. The switch LEDs in my titanium light are amber in color and produce a beautiful warm glow that just looks fantastic in my opinion. The auxiliary LEDs can be set to high or low outputs, a blinking mode, or simply turned off, and these settings are accessed by seven presses of the button in normal mode, or three presses while in lockout. If you press and hold on the last click, the LEDs will cycle between seven different colors, red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, magenta, and white. There are also two special modes, a rainbow mode that cycles through every color except white, and a battery indicator mode that uses the different colors to display the remaining charge left. On their highest output, these aux LEDs are actually quite bright and basically act as a beacon so the light is very easy to find in the dark. On high, these LEDs are bright enough to replace a normal moonlight mode all on their own. Though, of course, their RGB nature means they have terrible CRI. This does basically provide a stock option for a red or green low mode, which is pretty cool. Honestly, though, I think they're too bright and are kind of disturbing if you want to use the D4 as a bedside light with this setting, like I do. I do like to keep my titanium model in yellow to match the switch lights, and personally think it looks awesome. Low, however, is actually very useful, as it is so low it's only just barely noticeable most of the time, but is clearly visible in the dark without being obnoxious. It makes for a perfect locator light, and the subtle lighting is a very cool effect. Unfortunately, the colors are not balanced as well, and on low, red is much dimmer than the other colors, so yellow is just green, magenta is more just blue, and cyan is also mostly just green. I wish the blue and especially red colors were brighter while in these settings. In fact, this seems to be a fault with the way the aux LEDs are actually programmed. Each aux setting has a certain amount of brightness, and they simply add upon each other to create the other colors. So the whole system is a little bit imbalanced. These aux lights tend to confuse people who see them for the first time. I often get asked if they're supposed to be just on all the time. It takes some getting used to, especially if you use the high setting because it's so bright. You could turn them off if you want, but there's really not any need to, as the low setting has such a small drain that it doesn't actually impact the battery life. The drain does depend on the color, but on the low setting, the current draw is always lower than the battery's self-discharge rate, which means self-drain will kill the batteries before the aux LEDs do. Unfortunately, the drain is much higher while on the high mode, and will impact battery life over time. The aux LEDs alone will drain a battery in a little over a month if left on high, which is kind of a bummer. In fact, the minimum ramp level of the light itself has a lower drain than the aux LEDs on high, so you'd be just as well off leaving your light running at this level when not in use. The side switch lights are tied to the front aux LEDs and will behave the same while off, but will also operate while the light is on. If the light is below the maximum regulated level, the side switch lights will be on and low, and they will switch to high once the light leaves its regulated drive mode. Of course, the linear driver is fully regulated, so I'm not sure exactly what causes these switch lights to turn on high, but somewhere in the middle of the ramp they will switch brightness. These lights cannot be controlled independently. Because of this, I do have mixed feelings about the auxiliary LEDs. Mainly, I wish there was a brightness level right in between low and high, as I simply think low is too low and high is too high. I also wish the side switch and the front LEDs could be controlled separately, 
I would love the front lights to be low while the side switch is on high. Finally, while trivial this is most important to me, I wish the colors worked properly while on low. I'm just kind of disappointed that I can't actually have yellow or magenta on the low setting. These are all just nitpicks really, but this is supposed to be a thorough review and those are my opinions. At the end of the day though, I love the Aux LEDs. They're super cool and super useful. I am a big fan of glowing flashlights, but this is an even better solution as it quickly allows for battery readouts and mode indication while operating as a locator in the dark. The MSR D4 V2 comes standard with two different driver options. The most popular driver is the FET plus one setup, with one FET chip to push tons of current to the LED, and an extra 7135 linear regulator to provide current control up to 350 milliamps. The other is the 5 amp linear driver, which provides full linear regulation throughout the entire range. All versions utilize the Atmel ATtiny 1634 microcontroller for the actual logic. Other drivers are available as a special order, but I can't cover them all, so we'll just stick with the standard options. The FET driver is essentially a hot rod, and when set to turbo, the direct drive will effectively supply the emitters with all of the battery's available current. This provides an incredible amount of light and lots of heat to go with it. Throughout the first portion of the output ramp, the light is regulated, while it switches to a hybrid drive mode utilizing the FET about halfway through, which will run up until the ramp ceiling. When set to turbo, the driver switches to full FET control and full direct drive, effectively disappearing from the current path. PWM is used to control the output level below this, which is considerably less efficient when the FET is in use. However, an interesting advantage of this design is the color consistency it provides. As the PWM does eliminate some of the extra green colors the LED can potentially produce when running off a current controlled circuit. The linear driver is provided alongside the Nichi emitters and has a similar design, but the FET circuit has been disabled, as these LEDs cannot be pushed as hard without burning out. The 7135 has also been replaced with the more efficient custom linear driver circuit, the same used in the KR4. The output is current controlled throughout the whole ramp and lacks any PWM. It can provide the same output levels regardless of battery voltage. Because of its regulation, it is supposedly more efficient than the FET at higher levels, but is limited to provide a maximum current of 5 amps. It also does not allow the same fine control on the lower end of the ramp. An odd quirk of this driver is the strange behavior on the minimum ramp levels. When the ramp floor is below level 3 out of 150, the driver will essentially shut off and leak a tiny amount of current into the LEDs. This will technically provide lower lows than the FET driver can, but the output is often unstable and some flickering is visible. When activating the light to this low level, it actually takes a second to start up due to both the driver behavior and the LED temperature. In fact, if the light is run on turbo and then switched to ultra low, it can take quite a bit of time for the LEDs to actually turn back on. When making this review actually, I'd heard that the ultra low will sometimes fail on these levels with this driver, but it was not until I had nearly finished making the video that I had this issue occur. I was using the light on ultra low when it started flickering out on me, and it proceeded to just die out. I don't really know why this happened, as the light was not hot and hadn't been used on turbo, so all I can conclude from this is that the behavior below level 3 is inconsistent and unreliable. Actually, though it's technically a fault, I kind of like the ultra low slow start and subtle flicker on this driver. It's just kind of cool in my opinion, and allows for some extremely low lows. It is, however, annoying at times when turning the light on to ultra low from off, as I habitually hold the button until I see the light turn on, and because of the delay we'll keep holding, which just skips the ultra low and starts ramping up. A minor issue that just takes some getting used to, but annoying nonetheless. All of this can be easily sidestepped if you just set the ramp floor level to 3, where everything works as normal. As a final note, the FET Plus 1 driver does produce a high-pitched whine when operating in hybrid drive, as a result of the PWM control. If you are sensitive to high-pitched noises like I am, this can be an annoyance. Because of their different driver modes, the driver selected will have different battery requirements. If you are using a FED equipped model, you will probably want a battery capable of delivering a constant high current. The most popular batteries for this light are the Samsung 30Q and the Sony VTC6, which both provide a maximum 20 amp current with a respectable 3000 milliamp hour capacity. There are cells with higher current draws, but capacity will drop off from here which is not worthwhile for this light in my opinion. If you prefer a higher capacity, you could certainly use cells with a lower current draw, but the maximum output that can be obtained will drop accordingly. 
Because the linear driver maxes out at 5 amps, most 18650 cells can be used without issue. Additionally, high drain cells won't really provide any advantage here. I prefer to run either the LG MJ1 or the basically identical Sanyo NCR 18650GA, which both provide 10 amps of constant current and have 3500 milliamp hour capacities. Most 18650 cells will work just fine here, but unlike the FET driver, you cannot use any cell with less than 5 amps of constant current without seriously degrading the battery. This probably won't be an issue, most 18650s can provide this, but it is something to be aware of. Because these lights will only run off of unprotected cells, you absolutely must understand lithium-ion battery safety. Mishandling these cells could literally kill you, so please learn to handle, store, and charge them properly. The D4V2 does possess electrical protections, including a 2.8 volt low voltage protection and reverse polarity protection, so the light itself should not cause any issues. Both drivers have their pros and cons, but I think the FET Plus One driver is functionally superior for the most part, and certainly is more fun. However, if you want to use the Nichia E21A or 219 LEDs, you will need the linear driver instead. You could of course special order whatever driver you want and run these emitters with the FET Plus One anyway, which some people report works without issue but just be aware of the dangers of doing this. You could also order a more powerful version of the linear driver, which provides either 7.5 amps or 9 amps of current, which may actually be the best option, but I'll have to look at that in another video. MSR lights are available with a wealth of emitter options with multiple available color temperatures, which will affect the price of the final order. For no extra charge, the D4V2 can be purchased with the Luminous SST20 in two varieties, a cooler temperature variant that provides higher output, and the warmer, high CRI version. My Cyan D4V2 is equipped with the 95 CRI SST20 and 4000K. The light can also be purchased with Cree XBL High LEDs, which provide excellent white tints, decent throw, and the highest output of all the options, but will come with a $10 premium. On the other end of the spectrum are the Nichia E21A emitters, which provide an awesome, super high CRI of 98, and a beautiful, clean white tint. My titanium model is equipped with the E21As in a warm white 2700K. All of the emitter options have several color temperatures to choose from, with this light being available with everything from an orange 2000K E21A to a cool 6500K XPL high. There are a few other options available as well, such as a 660 nanometer deep red SST20, an 85 CRI 2800K XPL high, and at the time of this review, neutral and warm white Nichia 219B LEDs. However, all of these options are based on availability, so many will come and go. There are many LEDs available by standard, but should you feel so inclined to custom order, you can purchase this light with a tint mix that utilizes multiple LEDs of different temperatures, and you could even order a special 730 nanometer far red or 360 nanometer ultraviolet LEDs. I believe you could also purchase this light with a variety of either white or colored Osram emitters. Hank will also provide any of these options in a mule version, which is essentially a bare PCB with 8 LEDs instead of 4, and which lacks optics to provide an even floodlight. If you want maximum performance, then certainly purchase the Crete XBL high emitters. They will provide over 4300 lumens of output with a decent amount of throw, and have very clean white beams. The normal SST20s will provide close to the same output without the extra costs, but have low CRI and poor coloration, so I'd probably skip them. If you want fantastic color rendering, then the E21As are the way to go. They are much less bright and are basically just floodlights, but the beam is absolutely beautiful and has the best color I've yet seen. If you want something that is just great all around, the high CRI version of the SST20 has massive output with over 3000 lumens and a fantastic CRI of 95 with a beautiful neutral or warm white tint. Because of this, I do think the high CRI SST20 emitters in 4000K are all around the best option. This is where the fun begins. Alright, I've mentioned the output enough times already. Time to actually show the numbers. The MSR D4V2 is capable of some pretty awe-inspiring output for such a small light, with my SST20 version putting out just over 3,300 lumens on turbo. Considering the size of this thing and the emitters used, that is a pretty awesome amount of light. Unfortunately, the heat buildup means that the output will very rapidly drop from this high level, and over the course of 3 minutes it will drop, climb, and then stabilize at an output of about 540 lumens. This stabilized output will run for about 3 hours or so before dying out, which is pretty impressive. Turbo itself will really only be insanely bright for about 20 seconds before it drops back into just very bright. The 5 amp driver will produce only about a third as much output, with my 2700K light measuring in at an even thousand lumens. This is still a ton of light, 
and the drop off here is much more gradual, with the light taking about 4 minutes to level off at around 155 lumens, which will run for another 2 to 3 hours or so depending on the cell used. While the step down is gentler and slower, the percentage loss is actually slightly higher than the FET version of the light, with the stable operating output being only 15% of the turbo maximum, as opposed to the 17% output retention of the SST20. This might not sound like a lot, but it's very noticeable in practice. There's a big visual difference between 155 and 540 lumens. In either light, the stabilized output will gradually see change as the temperature regulates over time, so some of these lumens may return with prolonged use as the light cools back down. This is also dependent on the materials used and environmental conditions, so you may see different results. The heat produced by this light is absolutely no joke, and renders the D4V2 rather dangerous when mishandled. The heatsink is quite small, and the light will quickly begin to overheat at higher levels. When set to turbo, it will instantly feel hot in the hand and becomes almost untouchable within just 30 seconds. Because the head is so small, the heat is very concentrated at the front, and this light is absolutely capable of starting fires. Should it be accidentally activated to turbo while in a pocket, you can expect this light to literally burn a hole in your pants. Now, realistically this is a bad thing, but frankly it's also awesome and this light can provide lots of high temperature entertainment. There is an intelligent temperature control circuit on the D4V2, which will pretty much immediately drop the output as the heat builds. The maximum accepted temperature is adjustable in the interface, which tells the ITC how far to let it go before trying to back it off to prevent damage. This curve is very sharp, and there will be a noticeable drop in output during the first few seconds of runtime, which renders the turbo mode as little more than a party trick. Sure, you can light up a field for a bit, but you simply cannot rely on using that light for longer than a minute or so. It just won't happen. Whether or not you find that to be practical is up to you and your use case. There's not actually much to complain about though, as physically it's just not possible to get that kind of output in such a small package without these issues, and this is always going to be the case in a light of this size. Just don't expect extended usage on the highest output levels and you'll be good. Where this does become an issue for me is when the floody nature of the beam is taken into account. The lower the beam intensity, the more output is needed to compensate, and I find myself kicking the D4 into much higher modes than I normally do with other flashlights simply because it's so floody. Not only does this result in noticeably shorter run times, but I can actually see the output begin to trail off as the light heats up, which is kind of annoying in usage. In addition to this, the lack of proper current control in the upper ramp levels means the output will slowly decline with the battery voltage, regardless of heat. Because of the battery used, the output needed, and the low efficiency at high levels, my aluminum D4 is literally the only 18650 light that I've actually killed in just a single night of normal usage. It really doesn't last, which puts a damper on my enjoyment of this light. Practically, my E21A light performs about the same. The light is well regulated of course, which provides consistent output levels as the battery voltage drops, and allows for the highest levels to still be obtained with low battery voltage, which is a big advantage. Unfortunately, this particular linear driver and E21A pairing is not very efficient, somewhat negating the advantage this driver should have. Worse, because the beam is so diffuse, I find myself pushing it even higher than my other D4. Thankfully, the larger cell and still slightly more efficient driver do help even it out, so I get decent run times with this light. Because I run the aux LEDs on high, it still needs a recharge every 3 weeks or so. Where the linear driver fares significantly better is heat management. Turbo certainly still gets hot, but it's far from the fire brand of the FET model, and while still uncomfortable to hold, it doesn't burn my hand. This is also partially due to the LEDs used, but I only have these two to compare, so I can't give detailed information on that. The general trend will be about the same though, regardless of the emitters chosen. Ultra low modes will be heavily affected by the driver choice. As discussed earlier, the FET has cleaner and more granular control over the lowest levels, while the messy linear driver does technically get lower. On level 1 out of 150, I measured 0.19 lumens for the FET, while the linear was only half as bright at 0.098 lumens. Level 2 is an even step up for both, but level 3 puts out 0.38 lumens on the FET and 1.12 on the linear driver which is a significant step up. If having an even sublumen mode is super important to you, then technically the FET is better with its clean output, but realistically the linear driver is actually dimmer and works just as well. The stable output at level 3 is still just a single lumen, which is great, so if you're concerned about that weird output at the minimum levels, just set it to level 3 and it'll work fine. Ultimately, I have very mixed feelings about these lights in terms of their output. Yes, the FET driver provides tremendous output, but it does so at the cost of efficiency and realistic usability. 
Normally I wouldn't care so much except for the fact that I just feel like I need to use high outputs with these D4 V2s, as opposed to the lows and mediums I am more accustomed to with higher intensity lights. The linear driver should have solved these issues, but isn't as efficient as it could be, and then you give up the super high output that is a big part of what makes the light special. Thus, choosing a driver can be difficult. I guess performance-wise, the XPL high emitter should provide more output, more intensity, and better efficiency, which may alleviate these problems, but I don't have these LEDs so can't say for certain. It must be considered once again that these lights are more so hobbyist items than anything else, and practicality isn't really the goal. Most people buying these will be fine with frequent charging, but regardless, the D4 V2 is a poor choice for a workhorse light used for extended periods of time. This could be different for you, but this is definitely what I have found in my own usage. That said, I think most people purchasing this light will be happier with the power coming from the FET Plus One, which is the driver I mostly recommend. If you actually want to get a lot of use out of your D4 V2, the linear driver may be the better option. Really, though, as interesting as all that is, the choice of driver is really just secondary to the emitter choice, and this is the kind of light you'll want to collect anyway, so really, why bother choosing just one? The light utilizes TIR optics made by Carclow in the UK, with an extra piece of mineral crystal glass on top to provide scratch resistance. Most versions of the light will ship with standard 10622 clear optics, while the E21A option comes with a frosted 10623 optic. In either case, you can order the other optic as an extra. The TIR design provides a large, even hotspot with a dim and wide spill. The beam through the clear optic is more intense, and some subtle cartwheeling is visible on the edges of the hotspot, but otherwise is very clean. There is almost no tint shift visible, and the beam is just very natural and pleasant. To my eyes, the Floody optic provides a perfectly clean beam, devoid of any artifacts. This optic will only slightly reduce the output of the light, in addition to dramatically reducing the intensity. There is no visible tint shift, and the light produced is very soft and pleasant. The cartwheeling is not present here, so if you want your beam to be immaculate, then this is the way to go. With the SST20, the clear optic produced 20,068 candelas of intensity at max, while the frosted optic produced 12,541 candelas, so nearly half. The E21A light is much less intense, with the stock frosted optic producing only 3,347 candela at startup and 617 after stepping down. The clear optic bumps it back up to 7,310, which again is about double. This is much higher, but still far less than the SST20s. While there are different optics available, the LEDs are going to have a bigger impact on the actual beam quality. My Cyan has the SST20s and 4000K, which is probably my favorite temperature at this point. It is warm, but not excessively so, and provides a very natural, soft white color that mimics the tones of the late afternoon sun. The best way I can describe this is just pleasant and natural. These LEDs do of course provide a CRI of 95, which renders colors very accurately. The SST20s are known to have a slight greenish tint, especially on lower levels, and mine definitely display this characteristic. The amount of greenish will depend on the specific color bin, so if that bothers you, you may want to try a tint mix or simply a different emitter. I personally don't care about this. I don't find green unpleasant, and the eye will even it out in the dark anyway, so it doesn't really matter to me. If color is of high priority, then the E21A emitters are perfect for you. My 2700K LEDs are very warm, mimicking an incandescent light bulb and providing a beautiful golden light. Rated at 98 CRI, these are the most color accurate LEDs I've yet seen and are very close to center on the black body line, leaning just the slightest bit magenta. I almost regret not getting this emitter in 5000K, which I imagine would provide a perfectly neutral white beam. I think the frosted optic is ideal for these, providing a super floody beam that nicely fills an area. This is amazing for close-up and indoor use, but quite inefficient outdoors because of its weak throw. In addition, these emitters are technically a poor match for the Carclow optics, as the pairing only provides about 88% optical efficiency. If the clear optics are used, the beam will still be very clean but will display noticeable tint shift, so ultimately I think the diffuse optics are better. Functionally speaking, I think the SST20s and the clear optic are the best all around, with a great general purpose beam and excellent color, though the Nichia option gets more use from me as it's so unique and fun. The warm color is very nice for usage late at night, as it is much gentler on the eyes. One final note on color. While I cannot exactly prove this, I do believe the color of the pill will have an effect on the beam color, as the TIR optics allow for the light from the LEDs to bounce off the material surrounding and out into the rest of the beam. While it is very slightly noticeable in the actual beam, it is especially obvious if I simply switch to the white aux LEDs on both lights, 
The titanium model is noticeably redder, and I suspect the copper pill is responsible for the rosier tint in the beam. The inverse with the cyan model is true. It likely adds some bluish-greenish tint to the beam. While this effect is extremely subtle, I would recommend purchasing the black model if you just don't want the beam color to be affected at all. I've stated a couple times that this is a dangerous flashlight, and it very much is in a practical sense. But the real danger here is far more insidious, causing greater damage than a mere hole in your pants. No, what makes this light truly dangerous is the fact that it is just so addicting, you will absolutely want more. All the emitters, the different drivers, fancy materials, custom specifications, and then you'll need every other light Hank sells. This isn't a mere gateway drug, we are well beyond that point already. Buyer beware, the MSR D4 V2 can very likely cause your wallet to burn even faster than your thigh. Seriously though, this is one of the best flashlights I've ever used, and I believe that every flashlight enthusiast should own one. The performance is incredible, the interface is fantastic, the beam is almost perfect, the design and build are awesome, and the value is amazing. If you're into flashlights, you need to purchase one, and there are so many options that you'll be able to find exactly what you need, or you could just collect every variation you can afford. However, it's not perfect, of course, and for all of my praise, the reality is that this is just not a light for the average user. Not only is it complicated, the light is delicate, it's rather dangerous, the battery life and efficiency is kind of poor, and only hobby-style batteries can even be used. This is absolutely not a light I recommend to most people, it's just not made for the average user. In fact, as much as I love it, the D4 V2 is not even a light I consider to be a good EDC option for myself, considering it offers its poor battery performance with my usage, and requires high output due to its floaty nature, while lacking the thermal mass to maintain such an output. Ultimately, when carrying the light, I feel like it's more of a liability than an asset. Don't get me wrong, it's certainly functional and I've used it a lot, but realistically, this is just not very practical. Where it kind of offsets this is the fact that I just want to carry it everywhere. The price tag is shockingly low for what these provide, with the starting price being only $45. I paid $48 for my aluminum light and $93 for the titanium light, which I consider a steal in both cases. Hank sells his products at internationaloutdoor.com, which allows for general customization of the lights. However, when ordering this way, you will have to deal with international shipping from China, which is free with orders over $45, but will take a while. Alternatively, JL Hawaii on eBay is the official reseller for Hank's lights in the US, and has many different options on hand for much quicker shipping. These are already pre-built and aren't customizable really, but there are many different variations available. If you want something custom, you will have to send an email to Hank Wong himself. Any custom light will be priced as Hank sees fit. If you want to modify the light yourself, there are many resources online, and many members of the community who will be able to help you out if you ask around. <sighs> Alright, so after all that work, uh, I didn't really write a transition to the outro. But uh, this was certainly a long video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you found it helpful. These lights were not sent in for review, I purchased both of them with my own money. At first I wasn't actually interested in buying them, I thought they were just overrated trendy lights that the reddit horde pressures everyone into buying, but actually I, I love them. The D4 V2 is now one of my all time favorites. There are several other lights in Hank's lineup I want to review, but it will probably be a while before I do. I'm obviously not an expert, just someone who likes flashlights and occasionally makes videos about them. Uh, please let me know what you think of this video, and if you have any questions or suggestions, please leave them down in the comments below. If you've actually watched this far, thanks for your support and for sticking around. Your viewership really helps out the channel, and I appreciate it very much. Um, there's a lot of really excellent resources online that helped me to make this video. If you're interested, I can link some of them. Uh, if I don't forget, I might. Um, but <laughs> just check around. There's, there's tons of stuff on uh, Candle Power Forums, Budget Light Forums, Reddit. Lots of great reviewers have covered this light already, so there's, there's tons of good stuff out there. Um, so, I have nothing else to drone on about. So consider liking the video and subscribing. That would really help the channel out. Uh, again, I, I appreciate it. I always read the comments. Um, okay, this is too long.